Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is um, the intestinal stem cells, okay, and their role in the renewal of the epithelium of the small intestine. Okay, so we're in this video going to specifically concentrate on the small intestine rather than the large intestine. Okay, so intestinal stem cells then. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, right, so we're going to um, start off by discussing uh, the anatomy of the small intestine, and then we'll move on to the histology, because a good understanding of the histology of the small intestine is utterly essential for us to be able to discuss the role of intestinal stem cells. Okay, we'll then discuss the role of intestinal stem cells in the renewal of the epithelium of the small intestine because the epithelium of the small intestine is not just constant. You don't just have epithelial cells which remain there for your entire life. They are continuously replaced, basically, and shedded into the lumen of the uh, intestine. Okay, and we want to look at the role, the well, the crucial role that the intestinal stem cells play in generating these new uh, cells that are going to replace the ones that we're losing, basically. Okay, right. So, we're going to start off by discussing the macroanatomy uh, of the small intestine, just so that we're all clear on that, and then we'll discuss the more uh, microanatomy, the histology, and then we'll move on to the role of the intestinal stem cells. Okay, right. So we'll show the anatomy of the small intestine in the context of a few other portions of the gastrointestinal tract. So we'll start our drawing here with the esophagus. Okay, so this tube here, this represents the esophagus. Okay, now I'm using the silly British English spelling of esophagus just because that's uh, the spelling that I was brought up with. Uh, but if you prefer to use the American English spelling of esophagus, just get rid of that O there. Okay, right, so here is our esophagus in green. Okay, then it's going to enter the stomach here. So this is going to be the stomach, like so. Okay, and then in between the esophagus and the stomach, you're going to have a sphincter. And this sphincter is a thickening in the circular smooth muscle that surrounds the esophagus, uh, which is capable of uh, contracting and um, therefore constricting the lumen uh, of this tube and stopping contents from moving between the two um, structures, between the stomach and the esophagus. So that's important in preventing stuff from the stomach going back into the esophagus. Okay, so this sphincter is known as the uh, gastroesophageal sphincter. Okay, so gastro means pertaining to the stomach, esophageal means uh, pertaining to the esophagus, so this is the sphincter between the stomach and the esophagus. Okay, right, so I'll underline the gastroesophageal sphincter in red here. Okay, right, then after the gastroesophageal sphincter you have the stomach here. Okay, now the stomach is divided up into uh, separate portions, okay? Uh, so, uh, the portion up here, okay, which I'm separating out up here, which is in blue here, this is the portion that's furthest away from the entrance into the small intestine, okay? And this portion up here is what's known as the fundus of the stomach. Okay, now fundus means furthest away from the entrance. Now you may say, wait a second, but the entrance is here. But with regards to this naming system, we view the entrance as the um, entrance to the small intestine over here. So the fundus is the portion that's furthest away from uh, the beginning of the small intestine, basically. Then the next major portion that you have is this portion here which I'll uh, colour in orange here. Okay, so this portion here. Uh, and this is known as the body of the stomach. Okay, so this is all the body. Uh, and then this last portion right down here, which I'll colour in turquoise here, this is known as the antrum of the stomach. Okay, uh, and this is the portion that leads into the small intestine. 
There is then another sphincter separating the end of the stomach from the start of the small intestine. And I'll colour in this, stomach, uh, this sphincter in blue here. Okay, and this sphincter which guards the entrance to the small intestine here, this is known as the pyloric sphincter, or just as the pylorus. Okay, right, so again, this can contract and constrict the lumen between uh, the stomach and the uh, small intestine. Okay, right, a little bit more anatomy of the stomach then. Uh, so, the name for this aspect of the stomach, which has this very large uh, curve here, this is known as the greater curvature. So, I'll colour this in in vivid purple here. So, this aspect of the stomach that I'm colouring in in vivid purple here, this is the greater curvature of the stomach, okay? The other aspect, um, whoops, where's the argon? Greater curvature, okay? The other aspect of the stomach on the other side, which I'll now colour in in red here, this is known as the lesser curvature, okay? So this is a smaller curve, even though it's actually a steeper curve, so you could say that the curvature surely is bigger, uh, but um, because it's smaller in actual size, it's called the lesser curvature. Okay, so uh, that just refers to the two sides of the stomach, basically, the lesser curvature and the greater curvature of the stomach. Okay, right. Then we go from the pylorus into the first portion of the small intestine. Okay, and I'll put this here. So this first portion of the small intestine, which has this characteristic C-shape here, is known as the duodenum. Okay, so uh, this is a portion then of the small intestine. So the small intestine is going to be divided into um, three separate portions, and this is the first portion here the duodenum. Okay, right, and a lot of digestion is going to occur within the duodenum. Okay, then, after the duodenum, the next portion of the small intestine is called the jejunum. Okay, and this folds this way and then folds this way as well. Okay, so all of this is the next portion of the small intestine, uh, which is known as the jejunum. Okay, right. And I think I'll colour in the jejunum in turquoise here. So all of this is the jejunum. The final portion of the small intestine, which is then going to feed into uh, the beginning of the large intestine, is the ileum, or the ileum, however you want to pronounce it. So this last portion here is the ileum. Okay? And I think I'll colour in the ileum in vivid purple here. So this is the final portion of the small intestine, the ileum. Right, so that's the macroanatomy of the small intestine. We are dealing with the jejunum, uh, sorry, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum all put together. All of them together make up the small intestine. Okay, uh, and I haven't shown the large intestine uh, in this um, diagram, but the ileum will be feeding into firstly the cecum and then the ascending large intestine, the transverse large intestine, and then the uh, the descending large intestine. Okay, right. So, um, we are now going to look at the structure of the wall of uh, the small intestine. So, effectively, we're going to take uh, a cross-section through this. So, you can imagine taking your small intestine here, okay, uh, then um, cutting through it, like so, and we're now going to have a look at the uh, structure of the wall, okay? So effectively, we're now going to look at a picture like this, but we're just going to look at a little section of it. So we're now looking through the tube, the tube is here, and we're going to look at the wall of the um, small intestine, basically, and it's pretty much the same for the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, okay? So, we're just going to take a little picture like this and have a look at the histology of the small intestinal wall then. Okay, right. So, we start off with the outermost layer, which is the epithelial cell layer. Now, uh, the small intestine does not just have a smooth epithelium, okay? Instead, it's going to have... Um, villi protruding out all over the place. So, let me show this. So, here is a villus here, okay? 
and this is a projection which has many epithelial cells on its surface that projects into the lumen of the small intestine. Okay, like so. Then you also have projections inwards into the wall. Okay, so invagination. So there's going to be a little invagination of the epithelial cells here. So you can imagine that this is kind of the sort of basal level of the epithelium. And then it's got projections outwards, these evaginations in the form of these villi. And it's also got projections into the wall, uh, which are these crypts of Lieberkuhn, which we'll come back to in a moment. Okay, and then you'll have another villus coming up here, maybe. So in between neighbouring villi, you have these crypts of Lieberkuhn, like so. Okay, right. So let's label the picture up then. So these two structures here, these are villi. Okay, and uh, villi is the plural. The, the singular is villus. Okay, so if I just have an arrow to one of them, that's a villus. Okay, and these are projections which are covered in epithelial cells. So let me now separate this layer up into um, ep separate epithelial cells here. So these are all epithelial cells which are facing into the lumen of the small intestine. Okay. And then we've got cells down here in the crypts of Lieberkuhn. And we'll come back to these structures in a moment because there are special cells down here in the crypts of Lieberkuhn. The intestinal stem cells are going to be down here. So first I'll just give you the name of this invagination. So this invagination is called a crypt, okay, of um, Lieberkuhn, okay, which is quite a dramatic name for it. Okay, so then we've got another villus over here, which is also covered in these epithelial cells, like so. Okay, so the epithelium of the small intestine, then, is overall what's known as a simple columnar epithelium. Okay, so this is known as a simple columnar epithelium. So, simple means that uh, you only have a single layer of cells, and we can see that that's true. You don't have multiple layers of cells stacked on top of each other. So, contrast that to, for instance, the skin, or, or rather the epidermis, which has got many layers of cells. Okay, columna means that each of the cells is kind of column-like. Okay, so it's quite a tall cell, and then it's an epithelium because it is lining the body. Okay, right. Uh, so, all of these epithelial cells will be sitting on a basement membrane. So, what is actually supporting them and holding them where they are? Well, basically, it's a protein meshwork that sits underneath these cells, which is known as a um, basement membrane. Okay, and this protein meshwork of the basement membrane uh, mainly consists of collagen proteins. Okay, so in turquoise here, this is the basement membrane, which mainly consists of collagen proteins. Okay, so there are other proteins in the basement membrane as well. Notable examples include uh, fibrillin um, and also um, laminins. Okay, so this is the basement membrane. Right, okay, so that then is the epithelium. Now we will come back to the epithelium later on, okay? We will discuss all the different types of cells that are on this epithelium because there's not just one type of cell, there are many different types. But for now, let's just view it as a monolayer of cells, which is the outermost layer of the uh, smooth, uh, sorry, of the small intestinal wall, okay? So this side is facing into the lumen. So this space here, this is the lumen where the food is going to be contained. Okay, right. Uh, now, the next layer that's underneath the basement membrane is going to be known as the lamina propria, and it's going to be a layer of connective tissue. However, it's easier to talk about the lamina propria once we have shown the layer that's underneath that, because the issue with showing the lamina propria is that the lamina propria is going to be a different thickness at different portions of the small all intestinal wall. Because, for instance, when we've got these evaginations in the form of these villi, 
all of this is going to be lamina propria, whereas when we've got invaginations, the lamina propria is going to be much less thick. So it's best to firstly show the layer underneath the um, underneath the uh, lamina propria, and then come back to discussing the lamina propria. So the layer underneath the lamina propria, which I'll draw here, and you can see it already now makes it much clearer, but clearer because all of this is going to be lamina propria. Okay, this layer underneath the lamina propria is what's known as the muscularis mucosi. Okay, so this is going to be a muscle layer. It contains smooth muscle cells. So there are going to be multiple smooth muscle cells here, so I'll draw a few of these. So these are smooth muscle cells. Now this is not the main smooth muscle cell layer of uh, the small intestine. We're going to have muscularis propria later on, which is a much thicker layer of smooth muscle cells. But you have a small, thin layer of smooth muscle cells, which is just lining, um, the, well, which is just underneath um, the epithelium with the basement membrane with the lamina propria. Okay, so this is a layer of smooth muscle cells then. Now we can discuss the lamina propria. So all of this gap between the basement membrane and the muscularis mucosi underneath, all of this space that I'm colouring in in yellow here, all of this is lamina propria. Okay, so that's what I was trying to explain earlier. It's a different thickness depending on where you are looking. If you're looking at the point underneath the crypt of Lebacum, you've got a very thin uh, lamina propria. Whereas if you're looking at the point underneath, um, well, well, it, within a villus, then um, you've got a very thick lamina propria. Okay, so this is a layer of connective tissue known as lamina propria. So lamina just means layer. Okay, right. So, what does the lamina propria contain? Well, it's going to contain blood vessels and also lymphatic vessels. And we'll come back to those in a moment. Okay, so, one thing that I now want to talk about is what the concept of a mucosa is. Because people often talk about this word, mucosa, with regards to structures like the small intestine. Now, the mucosa means all of the layers that we have now discussed. Okay? So, the epithelial cell layer, the basement membrane on which the epithelial cells sit, the lamina propria of connective tissue, and then uh, the muscularis mucosi underneath that, all of those together, those four layers, are known as the mucosa of the small intestinal wall. Okay? So, all of this, which I'm now highlighting in pink, this is the mucosa here. Okay, right. Uh, now, Underneath the mucosa, and the reason I've discussed this piece of terminology is because it make, it'll make the name of the next layer make more sense. So the layer that's underneath the muscularis mucosi now is called the submucosa, okay, because it sits underneath the mucosa, which is these four uh, innermost layers. Okay, right. Now, the submucosa is another layer of connective tissue. Okay, so it's mainly going to consist of connective tissue. Now, what is running in this connective tissue? Well, in this connective tissue, you're going to have large blood vessels. You're going to have a large um, arterial blood supply here. So, large arterioles will be running in here. And you'll also have large venules running in here. Okay, and then much smaller arterioles uh, will branch off this large arteriole and go into the um, lamina propria. So they'll breach through the muscularis mucosi and they'll go into the lamina propria. And generally they go right up the villi like so. Okay, then you'll have capillaries obviously, which I'm not going to even attempt to draw. And then they'll reconverge into a smaller venule, which will then go through the muscularis mucosi and into the much bigger venule, which runs in the submucosa down here. Okay, so this is the blood supply that is supplying the epithelial cells, because remember, most of these epithelial cells are going to be involved in absorbing the contents of the lumen of the small intestine, and they need to be delivering it into the blood, basically. Usually it goes into the blood, anyway. 
Okay, now that brings us nicely on to the other type of vessel that you have in here, which is lymphatic vessels. Okay, now each villus, and this is going to be quite difficult to show, um, how am I going to do this? Um, each villus is also going to have a lymphatic vessel, okay, which isn't unfortunately showing up brilliantly there. I should have coloured it in in vivid purple or something so that it would show up. But each of these villus um, is, has a uh, lymphatic vessel, and this lymphatic vessel has a special name. It's known as a central lacteal. Okay, now basically a lot of the things that the intestinal epithelial cells absorb will go into the blood. However, certain things go into the central lacteals rather than the blood. So, for instance, the chylomicrons, which are uh, lipoproteins, which contain a lot of the fat molecules that have been absorbed by the small intestinal epithelial cells, those will go into the central lacteals rather than into the blood. Okay, so remember, all of the blood will go back into um, the general circulation via the liver. So it firstly goes through the liver. The liver sort of um, takes bits out and processes it. Um, and then it's dumped back into the general circulation. Okay, whereas the stuff coming through the central lacteals, this doesn't go through the liver first. It will go into the cisterna chile and then through the thoracic duct back into the superior vena cava. Okay, so some of the things that are absorbed by the intestine don't go into the blood, they don't go through the liver to get back into the central circulation, instead they go through these central lacteals. Okay, and again you have larger lymphatic vessels in the submucosa down here. Okay, so I'll colour the rest of this in in yellow to indicate once again that it's a layer of connective tissue. Okay, right. Then underneath the submucosa, we're going peripherally, we're going further and further away from the lumen towards the outer edge of the small intestine. Okay, so outside of the submucosa, you then have the thick layer of smooth muscle cells. So this is the proper layer of smooth muscle cells. Okay, and this layer is known as muscularis propria. Okay, so the proper muscle layer. Okay, now, muscularis propria can be divided into two layers. Okay, like so. There is the circular layer of smooth muscle cells. Okay, and then there is the longitudinal layer of smooth muscle cells. And these differ in their orientations. Okay, right. So all of the smooth muscle cells that are in this circular layer of smooth muscle cells, those will be oriented going round uh, the intestine, okay? So let me draw on a picture like so. So here is our intestine seen from the side, okay? Now, circular smooth muscle cells will uh, be oriented uh, circularly, okay? So they'll have their orientation going round the um, diameter of the small intestine, okay? So remember, if we think about what smooth muscle cells look like, they look like this, okay? So they have a long axis and then a very thin uh, axis along here, okay? So, basically, smooth muscle cells that are in this circular layer will be wrapped around the uh, diameter of the small intestine, whereas smooth muscle cells that are in the longitudinal layer, their um, long axis will be oriented in the same direction as which the uh, small intestine runs in, okay? So this is a smooth muscle cell that is oriented in the longitudinal direction, okay? And uh, this is a smooth muscle cell that's oriented so that it is wrapped around the diameter of the small intestine, okay? So smooth muscle cells that are in this circular layer will be oriented like so, and smooth muscle cells that are in the longitudinal layer will be oriented like this. Okay, right. So you have two layers then of smooth muscle cells, and this is these are the proper smooth muscle cell layers. These are the ones which are actually going to contract and move uh, the intestinal contents on through the intestines. So these are the proper ones. Okay, right. And then surrounding the longitudinal uh, layer of smooth muscle cells, you then have the most outer layer of the small intestine. 
Okay, and this outermost layer of the small intestine is known as the serosa. Okay, now, this basically is the peritoneal covering of the small intestine. Okay, so let me just make sure that you are familiar with the concept of the peritoneum. Okay, so the peritoneum is one of these most difficult concepts from anatomy. Okay, so basically, in your abdominal cavity, you have something called the peritoneal cavity. Okay, and the way that you should view this is like a balloon. Okay, so imagine um, a um, sort of rectangular shaped balloon, like so, like what I'm drawing here. Okay, and basically the balloon is full of fluid, okay, known as peritoneal fluid. Okay, so this balloon here is full of fluid, and the fluid is called peritoneal fluid. The surface of the balloon, like the plastic, is made up of a membrane, okay? And that membrane is known as the peritoneal membrane, or just the peritoneum, okay? Um, so, you have one of these structures in your um, abdominal cavity, okay? And what happens is uh, the abdominal or viscera, okay, including the small intestine, it gets pushed into this peritoneal cavity, but it doesn't actually ever penetrate the balloon. So nothing is actually within the peritoneal cavity. The intestine is not actually in contact with the peritoneal fluid. It just looks as though it is. Now let me explain how this works. So basically, if we view this balloon from the side, okay, like so. So we're now viewing this picture from this side here. Okay, then let's say I'm taking a piece of small intestine here. Okay, so we're seeing the small intestine from the side, so I'll make it look a little bit more convincing like so. Okay, and I might as well add in a little bit of three-dimensionalism to um, my peritoneum cavity as well. Okay, so there we go. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my piece of intestine here, which I'll have in blue, and I'm going to press it up against the peritoneal membrane here. So I'm going to effectively just push it into the peritoneum, okay? So I'm never going to break the peritoneal membrane. I'm going to be very gentle so that I never break the peritoneal membrane. But I'm basically just going to push this in. Now, what's actually going to happen then? Well, basically, something along the lines of this is going to happen. We'll imagine that the peritoneal membrane is extremely bendable, okay, so it's extremely malleable, malleable. So I'm now just pushing my piece of small intestine in, and the membrane is just forming around that, okay? So now it looks like my small intestine is within the peritoneal cavity, but it's not. It is not in contact with the peritoneal fluid. It just looks as though it is, because I've pushed it in like that. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this piece of peritoneal membrane here and this piece of the peritoneal membrane. I'm going to push them together basically. Okay, and what I'll end up with is something that looks like so. Okay, here is my piece of small intestine now suspended within the peritoneal cavity, but I'll stress again, I have not broken the peritoneal membrane at any point, so it is not actually within the peritoneal cavity. It looks as though it is because I've pushed it in like so, okay? And it's suspended by this uh, flap here of peritoneal membrane or a double peritoneal membrane because this is two pieces of peritoneal membrane pressed up against one another, okay? And this is known as the mesentery. Oh, well, never mind, I'll draw, write it out again here. So this is the mesentery. Okay, so this is how small intestine gets suspended uh, within the peritoneal cavity, and it's suspended by mesentery at the back, okay? And this is also how the small intestine ends up covered in a layer of the peritoneal membrane, because as we saw, I've pushed this in here, so there is a layer of peritoneal membrane now covering the small intestine. Okay, so this is peritoneal membrane here in vivid purple. That is what this serosa is. The serosa is a layer of peritoneal membrane that is covering the small intestine. Okay, so this is
peritoneum, basically. Okay, right. So that now is the histology of the small intestine. Okay, what we now want to discuss is the intestinal stem cells. Okay, right. So we are now going to talk a lot more about this epithelium here. Now the first thing to say is that the intestinal epithelium, the, intest the epithelium of the small intestine here, it's not just constant. You are not just born and you do not just maintain your uh, intestinal epithelial cells for your entire life. Okay, These are constantly being replaced. What happens is the intestinal epithelial cells at the tip of the villi here, okay, these will commit apoptosis, okay, they will commit cell suicide, and they will move into the lumen of the intestine. So continuously, epithelial cells here at the tips of the villi are being shed into the lumen of the small intestine. Okay, now, what then happens is all of the other cells along the uh, length of the villi, they start moving up. So if you're losing the ones at the tips, okay, so let's colour these ones at the tips in in purple. If you're losing these ones at the tips, the ones that are further down are now going to keep moving up to replace them. So there is this continue, uh, continual conveyor belt of epithelial cells that are moving up the villi, basically. Okay, now, you know, we can continue that on for some time, you know, these will continue moving up, but we're going to deplete the ones from the bottom if we're not careful. Okay, so that means that we have to create new cells, and the new cells are going to be created right at the bottom of the crypts of the bacoon. Okay, so right down here, you're going to have intestinal epithelial stem cells. Okay, so these are intestinal stem cells down here. Now, they're not actually right at the base of the crypts of Libacum. We'll come on to what is right at the base of the crypts of Libacum. But they're pretty far down, the crypts of Libacum. Okay, so these here, these are the intestinal stem cells. Okay, right. And these are going to be dividing and producing new cells which can then differentiate into the different cell types of the intestinal epithelium. And these are what are producing the new cells which are going to feed this conveyor belt and keep a, a constant supply of cells covering your intestine. Okay, so these are responsible for the renewal of the intestinal epithelium, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so, why do you need stem cells? What even is a stem cell? Well, a stem cell is a cell which is not fully terminally differentiated, okay? So, it's not fully specialised. Now, the reason that you need them is because the fully specialised cells which line the epithelium of the uh, small intestine, these can't divide anymore. Okay, uh, so let's discuss some examples of fully terminated, uh, terminally differentiated cells that line the epithelium. Okay, so the main type of um, epithelial cell that most of these epithelial cells will be is what's known as an enterocyte. Okay, and I'll draw a more in detail picture of an enterocyte here. Okay, so enterocytes look like this. Okay, so entero means pertaining to the intestine. Okay, site means cell. So this is a cell of the intestine, basically. Okay, so we'll say that these cells that are in vivid purple here are enterocytes. Okay, now at their apical face, they do not just have a flat surface. I know that on this picture here, I've drawn them with a flat surface. But in reality, they don't have a flat surface facing into the lumen. They have an um, uneven surface here. And they have these little finger-like projections off their apical surface. And by the way, their apical surface just means the surface that faces into the lumen of the small intestine. So apical just means the face that faces into the lumen of whatever tube you're talking about. Okay, right. Uh, so these little finger-like projections which project into the lumen of the small intestine, these are known as microvilli. Okay, so the intestine has these large finger-like 
<coughs> excuse me, and these large finger-like projections which project into the lumen of the intestine. Okay. Each of the enterocytes then now has these much smaller finger-like projections which also project into the lumen, and these are known as microvilli, the small villi. Okay, so this is an example then of a terminally differentiated cell. Okay, so I'll write that here. So this is a fully specialized cell, um, and it can't divide anymore. Okay, now what are these cells specialized for? Uh, well, they are specialized for the absorption of uh, the contents of the small intestine. So these are the cells which are actually going to be absorbing uh, nutrients out of the lumen of the small intestine and passing them onto the uh, blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels that are within the lamina propria. Okay, so these are responsible for absorption. So these can't divide, however, they are continuously apoptosing and passing into the lumen when they get to the tip here. Okay, it's the same for the other types of specialized cells that are within uh, the intestinal epithelium. So let's talk about some of the other um, fully differentiated cells that are in the intestinal epithelium. So you also have a cell type known as a goblet cell. Okay, and these are much rarer than uh, the um, enterocytes, but I'll draw a few on here. So, here let's say most of these cells are enterocytes, so all of these ones in purple are enterocytes, and then dotted around occasionally, what you'll have is a goblet cell. Okay, so we'll say that this one here in green, this is a goblet cell. Okay, now what is the purpose of a goblet cell? Well, goblet cells are not involved in absorption, okay? So they're not involved in taking nutrients uh, from the lumen of the small intestine and passing it to the blood vessels within the lamina propria or the lacteals within the lamina propria. Instead, they are involved in secreting uh, mucus, basically. So they are secreting mucus, which is then going to line all of the enterocytes. So all of the enterocytes have a layer of mucus over them and this mucus is produced by the goblet cells, basically. Okay, now, um, this mucus is to lubricate the surface of the small intestine because the food boluses need to move through the intestine and uh, to help the contents move, uh, you have this lubrication over the surface of the small intestine and this mucus is produced by the goblet cells. Okay, there are two other types of terminally differentiated cells uh, within the small intestinal epithelium. Okay, uh, the next one I'm going to discuss now is known as the uh, enteroendocrine cells. Okay, so we'll have this cell here that's amongst these enterocytes that I've now coloured in yellow. This can be an enteroendocrine cell. Okay, now as the name suggests, these enteroendocrine cells, and it should ideally be one word, okay, these enteroendocrine cells are involved in secreting hormones. So endocrinology is the study of hormones, okay. Uh, an endocrine substance is a substance that is released generally into the blood uh, to go and signal to other um, tissues. Okay, but it's... Um, so enteroendocrine cells are going to be secreting many peptides and other hormones uh, or signaling molecules. And a good example is serotonin that's secreted by enteroendocrine cells. And these signal to neurons and other things like that that are in the wall of the small intestine as well. Okay, right. So um, the final type of... Um, fully terminally differentiated cell that you have within the intestinal epithelium is not actually present on the villi. It's present right down at the base of the crypts of Lieberkuhn. And these are going to have quite a different lifestyle to these other ones that we've seen so far. Okay, so I'll colour these in red here. These are very different. Okay, so we'll discuss these separately to these other three that we've discussed here. 
peaks. So these ones right at the base of the crypts of Liebercum here are known as Panath cells, okay, and they are a part of the innate immune system, okay. The Panath cells secrete uh, proteins which are antibacterial, which will kill bacteria, okay. Um, so they are involved in trying to keep the intestinal uh, wall uh, infection free, basically. Okay, and as I say, all of the other intestinal epithelial cells are moving up and outwards, okay? So the enterocytes, the goblet cells, and the enteroendocrine cells, these all move up the villi and then commit apoptosis and then are shedded off. The pan of cells have quite a different lifestyle. Okay, right, so we'll continue this video, this discussion in the next video uh, where we'll discuss um, the intestinal stem cells in more detail.